Hey everyone, welcome to the hey Jesus guys. King podcast. Hopefully you're doing well. I'm here with Abraham. How you doing, Abraham? I'm good. I Great. thought you were forgetting my name there. For a I was actually going to call you Emil. Yeah, it happened the last one of the last videos. It so, did. Yeah. It did. I'm, I'm really <laughs> sorry. I'm really sorry. Please forgive okay. me. It's all right. Are you going to be right. coming back again? Look, man, we'll see how this one goes and then we'll... <laughs> great, great. Uh, well, today we are having an Easter special. Yeah, yeah. And obviously there are thousands of people that died on the cross, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the Roman Empire, even in the Persians, right? Yeah. Because they were the yeah. ones that started Initiated with the idea. On the trees. And, and the Romans came and they're like, oh... Let's perfect the art. Yeah, let's perfect it. People are not suffering enough. Yeah. Let, let's kind of elevate the pain. They were masters but in torture, yeah. They, they were, they were. Uh, along with the Babylonians, man, mm. they did horrible things. Yeah, and the but Assyrians too. Yeah, that's another topic. Um, <laughs> so my point was, is that we see a lot of people die on the cross, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, what makes Jesus different? Yeah, well, that's, that's the thing. So... Um, it was actually something I wanted to kind of hone in on the significance of the death and resurrection of Jesus um, as being like the hinge of the Christian church, the, the hinge of all the Christian faith. So the death and the resurrection of Jesus, that him dying on that cross, the significance of it is actually seen in his life and in the work that he did, in what he taught, in his birth. But ultimately, the death of Christ, his birth, his life, his living a perfect life is seen as more um, important or the importance of it is seen in his resurrection. All right. So if he hadn't raised, he was just another one of the thousands of people that died on a cross. Yeah. He, yeah. yeah. Well, that, that was my question yeah. is that um, what does what does it make? that Jesus stands out from everybody else, and that's yeah. his resurrection. His resurrection. Yeah. Paul, and, Paul spoke about that in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, the, the fact that if Christ was not raised, it's all in vain. Yeah, you and know? we are pitied. And we are, yeah, we're the most yeah, miserable men. Like, why are we here on earth not indulging in the flesh, not indulging in the things of the world? Why are we here looking for an eternal kingdom? If it's all in vain, if Christ did not raise, be raised. Because that means if Christ is not raised, we will not be raised either. There's no hope of eternal life. There's no hope of anything in in the, the next world. So this is one of the important aspects of the Easter message. So yeah, this is something that we tend to not neglect, but we don't emphasize as much, especially in Easter. We look at the cross, which is definitely important because... You have the steps of progress in the life of Jesus. You have his birth, which we celebrate in mm -hmm. Christmas. You have his life, because we have to understand with the gospel, Jesus had to live that sinless life. He had to live a life under the law, fulfilling the law perfectly. And they say that, you know, for the first 30 years of that man's life, in the first 30 years, if he fulfills the law perfectly, then he's a perfect man. Right. Okay. So that's the kind of the Jew, the Jews had this idea in the midrash and in the in their interpretation that it's like the first thirty years of a man's life you'll see how righteous of a man he is. Okay. And so Jesus is perfectly righteous, right? Because even in those thirty years he fulfilled the law perfectly, right? So that was the next step: the virgin birth, the incarnation, the perfect obedience to the law and to God and to His will, and then. The step after that is the death on the cross, where the entirety of God's wrath and the entirety of man's sin is placed on the body of Christ, is placed on Christ, and then the entirety of God's wrath for that sin is placed on Christ as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's the step that leads to the ultimate and the pinnacle of it, the hinge of the Christian faith, the resurrection. So he then dies. But because he's perfect, death does not have a hold on him, and he is raised from the dead. Right? Great, great. Yeah. So I would I would like to ask you a question, and a lot of people might ask that question or think about it. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, what evidence could you think of, biblically speaking, that Jesus did resurrect? Did actually rise, yeah. yeah. Uh, there, there are many um, things that we can look at historically. Um one of the things that we need to 
the reality of the situation is the Bible is a historical document. Mm -hmm. You know, even New Testament scholars who are not believers will say it is a historical document. We use it as historical proof. Yep. So there's one evidence. It's a historical document. It, it's historical proof. But also outside of the Bible, you have historical sources as well, like Josephus and you have um, Tertullian and you have many people who did speak about um, not just Jesus, but also his disciples, right? And the fact that when Jesus was raised, he made himself known to how many people? 500 yep. who saw him bodily risen. You know, his disciples saw his flesh and they saw, um, they, they touched him. They felt him. He was there. He was physically, bodily resurrected. And this is important because they had the Gnostic um, idea that Jesus was just an appearance, like a ghost, kind of mm -hmm. a spirit that looked and appeared to be human in yeah. the flesh, but was not. Um, and so the disciples saw it. But one of the biggest evidences of it is the fact that these 12, and not just the 12, but even the 500 that saw him bodily rose, their lives... After that, their persecution, the suffering, the torture, everything that they suffered, all right, all of the pain, they lived miserable lives. They did not live lives of luxury. They lived lives with purpose for the kingdom. And if they did not see him rise, and if they did not see him ascend into heaven, what would be the purpose in that? Like, yeah. they, it would make zero sense for twelve to 500 people living these lives of complete suffering over something they know to be a lie. Yeah, so so the idea is that um, people normally make up stories yeah. to get something out of yeah. it. But, but it to an like, extent. Yeah. To an extent. Like, you would lie to a point, and then once you get caught out, and, like, there are going to be repercussions, and your life is at stake, you're going to be like, all right, all right. Let me I'll just... back away. I'm going to back away. All right, I made it up. Yeah. I made it up. But then you have these 12 who suffered, um, you know, Peter is crucified upside down and um, John is boiled in oil and you have um, uh, uh, what's his name uh, Philip who goes down and he's he's um, butchered by the natives of of India you have um, Simon who's executed as well and stoned and you have all these men who suffered and suffered for something that they know they saw mm -hmm. the bodily resurrection and ascension of Jesus. So, on a personal level, because mm. that can connect with the disciples, right? Yeah. Um, they were facing death every day. Mm -hmm. And that's even Paul speaks about it, right? Yeah. We're, we're daily being persecuted. We're yeah. daily dying and, and so on. How that does facing death, uh, how does the resurrection impact us facing our end, our death? Yeah, because that's that's one of the tenets of the faith. It's like if Christ was raised, that means we will also be raised. Mm -hmm. And we're not just going to be raised to an eternal life of misery. We're going to be raised to an eternal life in his glory and in his kingdom. And so there's this hope and this joy. And Paul speaks about it. There's, you know, it's like there's the prize at the end. I'm running as though I'm competing because there's something there that is going to be beyond what the mind can understand and perceive. The same glory that Jesus was raised in will be the, a comparable glory that we're raised in as well. And so these earthly tents that fade are then transformed and transfigured into the glorious eternal um, body. And so what Christ went through in his death, comparable to what how we die in Christ as well, when we come to him in repentance and we, we live unto him, we rid ourselves of the world and that's what baptism is a representation of we die and then we are raised again in christ and so we start our resurrected lives on earth but the finality of it the fullness of it comes once we actually do pass on and and when christ does come back as well and so it gives us that hope that if christ is raised we can face death here easily because we know it's not the end you know amen Amen. Okay. Um, well, I was going to ask you a question because sometimes maybe someone might have that on their mind is if Jesus died for our sin, mm. we're saved from hell. Our destiny is heaven. Mm. If we die and go to heaven, why do we need to come back into our bodies to be resurrected? Like what's, what's the purpose of that? Mm. Aren't we already in heaven in spirit? So yeah, yeah. 
why do we really need to come and and come back to yeah, life? It's a good question. Um, that's another question that John the Apostle was targeting as well in what he was speaking of um, in the opposition to the Gnostic gospel, where everything physical is evil and everything spiritual is good, right? Because God is spirit. He exists in the spiritual realm, but then he creates the earth and he creates a physical world, right? So the importance of the physical world is like God creates this thing to be a further expansion of his glory and a further revelation of his glory. Man corrupts that, mm -hmm. right? So God makes Adam and Eve physical beings, also spiritual beings as well, right? But they're physical beings. They have a spirit to further extend and um, reveal his glory. They corrupt that. And now the purpose of the gospel is to reverse that corruption, to restore all things, to make all things new. And so the importance of it is like there is going to be this glorified new heaven, new earth. All right. What that's going to look like, we don't know, but it's a reversal of the corrupt order. It's a reversal of the sin curse. All right. Because mm -hmm. that's what Jesus' mission was. It was like, all right, well, Satan's not going to win here. All right, the devil came, he tempted, he came to steal, kill, destroy, but Christ is more powerful. And he's come in the flesh, he died in the flesh, he resurrected in the flesh, and now he will restore all flesh, all of those who are in him. Cool. Amen. Yeah. So the, the victory that we have in Christ is not that our soul and spirit are saved, mm, but, but also the... our own body. Yeah, yeah. So all of us, Christ yeah. is saving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why it's like, it's a holistic, it's a holistic um, uh, religion or a holistic belief system that we have. It's because like you have, for example, let's say with the Buddhists, right? They look at the things of the physical as being similar to the Gnostics as being um, part of a, a corrupt order. So we need to rid yourself of it, mm -hmm. right? It's not holistic in that sense. They don't believe that there's any redemption for the physical. The redemption is only in the mind and in the spirit and we're in yeah. the outside um that's not god's purpose god's purpose is to restore and to renew all things that he has created right like created the created order of god the universe that's god's work it's his handiwork and he has he has a a glorious plan for it that needs the second coming of christ and needs the finality of it and the destruction of sin completely to to be fulfilled in that sense so that's why like this whole idea the whole easter a narrative it's so crucial to the eschatology the eschaton so we're looking to the future now with christ so what christ did two thousand years ago doesn't remain there there's this hope and there's this waiting that the finality of it the finishing of it is coming when he comes back mm -hmm. you know and so we look forward to that that just it excites me when i think about it it gives me joy when i think about it that christ is coming he's restoring all things he's going to make all things new and we're going to have a place with him in that like that's just that's just grace on grace on grace and what why do you and i deserve to have any part or place in that kingdom nothing nothing like it's yeah. it it's incomparable like we can't it's incomprehensible that God would choose us, the most lowly, just dirt from the ground, literally. He made us from dirt from the ground. Why he would choose us to be a part of his kingdom, this eternal glorious kingdom. And yet Amen. he has. It's beautiful. Well, that comes to the next question. Yeah. Is that obviously we're looking at some evidence. What does the Bible say about it? Mm. That Jesus was resurrected in the flesh. And so will we because... He saves all of us, right? Like our soul, spirit, and body. He just renews everything. Mm -hmm. But to Abraham, for you personally, mm. what does the resurrection mean? So for me, uh, so like, how is it impacting your life? How is it changing your respect, uh, mm. perspective? Um, how does it influence your everyday walk with him? Yeah. Things like that. No, that's a that's a important one because for me personally, the gospel is a personal redemptive um, action, not just the big picture where you know Christ redeems all of humanity. He redeemed me specifically, mm -hmm. which is 
wild. So, yeah. sorry to cut you off. When you say all humanity, people might think you're a universalist. Oh, sorry. Uh. So, <laughs> so we're not universalists. Yeah. Um, we're also not Calvinists, though. Yeah. So, so we what don't we believe in what we do believe is that the work of Christ has made it possible for all who believe in Him to Amen. be saved. Right. Yeah. So all humanity. You look at Christ. You look to Christ. If you do, you're saved. Yeah, you know? and whosoever believes, whosoever. yeah. So, sorry, I almost went universalist. No, nah, it's, it's all good. It's good to clarify that. They, but, yeah. they, don't, they don't know you, so I thought mm. maybe most likely you might get a comment because mm. we've been getting some negative comments, man. Yeah, that's so good. Just, that's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's one um, less comment. That's yeah, one so, less comment. So we believe that those who look to Christ the same way that remember the story of you know Jesus used this as an example when the people of Israel sinned. Mm -hmm. and the snakes came in and bit them, and he raises up the bronze serpent, all right? That bronze, bronze, yeah, yeah. that bronze serpent, who does it heal? It heals Just everyone who looks at it. Looked at it, yep. Yeah. yeah, but some people didn't, right? Some people were so focused on the bite, and they were angry or whatever. They didn't look at it. They died, right? Mm -hmm. So there are so all of us have been bitten by sin. We have all been affected by sin. We've all been affected by death. Right, and the destruction that was caused through sin. Um, and sometimes we're so focused on that, or we're angry, or we're bitter, and we don't look to the one who can actually save us. So that's one aspect of it. It will heal you to look to Christ and to turn to Him. Right? So, anyway, that was a bit of a side tangent. Yeah, like but, a um, detour. Detour, but it's, a, <laughs> it's an important detour yeah. because we're looking at the importance of it for all people. And would that also Im impacts the resurrection, right? Yeah. Those yeah. who look to Christ and put their trust in Him will be part of the first resurrection. Yeah. yeah. And those who do not look to Christ, they'll be part of the second resurrection, yeah. and that's yeah. to judgment. That's right. And as the as it's called in the Book of Revelation, the second death as well. Mm -hmm. You know, being thrown into that finality of you know complete um, destruction internal destruction so that's what christ has come to save us it's not in his will that we perish right and so you are you're asking about it personally for me you take those truths those big picture christian truths and with the holy spirit living in us and there are times where we go through these things in our lives and these temptations and these doubts and whatnot the holy spirit lives in us to lead us in those truths on a personal daily basis and it's like there are so many times where um the tactic of satan which is to play with your mind and to lead you outside of kingdom purpose or to lead you outside of the the truth of the gospel um there are times where that would happen and the holy spirit comes in and puts a rein on your flesh and says no you're look the the rest of the world can go play with sin the rest of the world can go play with the flesh but you cannot you have you're you have on a that leash. You know, it, you're you're, you're <laughs> on this, and thank God for that. I, yeah, I guarantee you. If it wasn't for that, who knows where we'd be? You know. Well, that's why Jesus says, "I'm not going to leave you off. Exactly. So when I go, I'll send the helper, and that was that's and, the beauty. And and that's one of the the aspects. I you know I've been studying through the Exodus account, and it's one of those important things because they're freed from slavery, but they still have the heart of slaves. You know, they still have a heart that just doesn't understand what it means to be led by the spirit, to be led by God, to be led by a master who's not a hard task master like Pharaoh, mm -hmm. but who actually wants the best for you and wants the good for you. And he's like, I <clears throat> I have a desire to be your father. You are my firstborn. Right. Mm -hmm. And they kept resisting that. Mm -hmm. Right. Because they were so used to this slave mentality. And it's funny because sometimes we're freed from sin and we have this new life in Christ, but we're still affected by that mind of sin and that mind of the flesh and living in the flesh, yeah. you know? Yeah. And and God says, like you said, he doesn't leave us as orphans. He's given us the spirit to lead us into truth. And he is our shepherd. Yeah. And, and by that spirit, we call him our father. Yeah. 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 It's, it, it's, <clears throat> um, it, it's interesting that um, God has placed eternal life in our hearts, mm -hmm. right? Um we, as you also say that even in baptism, when we become Christians, we get baptized. And that in itself is a symbol that we die with Christ mm. 
we are resurrected with him. If you don't know about it, read um, Romans 6. Yeah. That's, um, that's where it is. But also, like, that's one example. Another example, Lot's wife. Yeah. She leaves yeah. the city, but she looks back. Mm-hmm. That's where her, her heart is. Her heart was there, yeah. So it, it's very important that when you're reading the word of God, it really makes sense. I'm going to answer my own question. How, how do I feel about it personally, mm. right? Uh, when I read the book of Acts, when I read the first century church, second century church, and, and so on, it really makes sense for them to go to the extremes. Yeah. It really makes sense. If you see a person that you've been following and this person says, I'm about to die, but I'm going to have victory over death. And if you follow me, I'm going to give that victory to you. Then whatever man does to you, it really doesn't affect where you are in Christ because you're like, you could kill this flesh, but you can't do anything after, right? And, and that's the difference between fearing God and fearing man. Yeah. Matthew 10, yeah. Jesus says, don't fear those who, who kill the flesh. Yeah. They can't do anything to you after that. Yeah. But fear God, because not only can he destroy the flesh, he can destroy, destroy your soul in hell. Mm. So the idea is, and, and sometimes people will, will look at my perspective of Christianity, but like, well, that seems a bit extreme. Yeah. I'm like, well, it's pretty extreme, <laughs> it, 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 but it doesn't like it totally makes sense with the book of Acts. Yeah. But then they think it's extreme. And I'm like, no, but you need to understand what Jesus done for you on the cross mm-hmm. and what he's done after that yeah. in three days that he literally defeated death. I like how Ray Comfort puts it. 10 out of 10 people die. <laughs> that's a statistics that you can't beat <laughs> like every human being will die eventually um, whether you have the best life now yeah and and people preach that right they preach hey have your best life now mm. or you could take the disciples way of life and it's going to be full of struggles yeah. persecution it's miserable. rejection it's miserable. Yeah. but guess what among all that there is overflowing joy in your heart. Yeah. And, and that's why you, you read the New Testament. Even you read First John. It says, I'm writing to you that your joy may be full. Mm. Like Christians, you could go through whatever it is in your life currently now. As long as you're following the Lord Jesus, your heart is overflowing with joy. Yeah. Even if it's persecution, even if it's rejection, you might get rejected at work. Because you're a Christian. You might get rejected by your family because you're a Christian. Your family may be from a different culture, different religion. Yeah. They might look at you. They might mock you, right? What does Jesus say about those who are persecuted, those who are rejected, those who are mocked in in the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew 5? He's saying rejoice. rejoice. Be glad. And pray so, for them. So among all that, there is the overflowing of joy because... Mm. What we are looking for is we're looking for a city that man did not build, that was built by God. That's yeah. what we see in Hebrews 11, mm-hmm. that Abraham was moving from one tent to another to another. Yeah. He did not sit anywhere. Why? It's because he knew, even though God promised the land to his descendants, he knew that this is not where his mm-hmm. eternal yeah. life is. That's not where his eyes were fixed. And he, and it's interesting because, yeah, he moved from tent to tent. He was actually pretty wealthy as well. Yeah. But he didn't put his heart or trust or anything yeah. in that. If he lost at all, he would still keep following mm-hmm. Christ and still feel, uh, sorry, still keep following God. Yeah, he's and, not a New Testament character. Sorry, <laughs> you know, by faith, he was following Christ. Yeah. But, yeah, so this is one of the things that... He did meet Christ. Yeah. This is one of the things that when we look... Um, and we we adopt the message of Christ personally in our in our day to day lives. We are like Abram; we are pilgrims in this world, and we have that mentality because the Spirit will not give us free reign to call this place our home. Mm-hmm. He can't, because if this place is our home, we put our heart, and we put our trust, and we put our mind, and we put our vision on this home. Yeah. That will then fade in thirty, forty years, depending how our diet is. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> um, like it's it's. I'll go before you, my friend. Look, you know, we don't um, know. Tomorrow is not guaranteed, and that's the that's yeah. the aspect of it. But um, we look at what Christ has done, 
And this is where Christianity is is a distinction. It's distinctive to a mere ideology. Mm -hmm. It doesn't stop at the idea, right? Yeah. Because it will impact your daily life. It will impact how you live, how you look at life, how you perceive the world, how you perceive every action that you make in the world, how you treat people, mm -hmm. how you worship. Like everything, every part of your life is impacted by this one belief. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the famous verse in Philippians 1, um, he's saying, but if I live on in the flesh, mm -hmm. this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Yeah. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Yeah. And I like how a lot of times you you see the disciples describing, uh, which is what Peter does as well, describing the flesh to be a tent. Mm. And, and not, that's, not a temp, not, not like a, a, a solid structure. Yeah, it's, it's not yeah. a solid structure. It's not a house. It's not something that you'll be like, I'm building this for the long term mm. and this is where I'm staying. No, they're like, this is a tent and we're moving from one place to another. And at one time it's going to come that, this tent is going to be stripped away mm. and we're going to be with the Lord. Such a good day. Th this is <laughs> this is what I encourage people. I say, the way you're living your life, are you setting up a tent or are you building a house? If your emphasis on this life is to build an empire yeah. right, for yourself and do the best you can to have a most fulfilled and meaningful life for yourself... Mm then I pity you. Yeah. I really pity you because er, all the treasures that you're building here, even if you destroy your bonds and build bigger bonds, guess what? Someone your else. soul will be, will be acquired of you. God's yeah. going to ask for your soul. And when you stand before God I, and, and you're going to look back, you're like, okay, all my treasures were on earth. Yeah. I've got nothing moving forward. Yeah. But Jesus says, he says, build your treasures in heaven. Yep. Something that someone cannot steal, mm -hmm. it cannot rot. Nothing can happen to yeah. it. It's safe in God's hands. Yeah. And these treasures, unlike what we have today, these treasures are eternal. That's the blessings of it. Yeah. Is you have uh, treasures in Christ that are going to be there for eternity. You might think, wow, like for a million years. No, a million years is a blink of an eye compared to eternity yeah think bigger think bigger as, as far as you go into the future god is there with you and you have that full satisfaction in him mm -hmm. so this is something very important when it comes to resurrection if the bible doesn't speak about death and resurrection and no afterlife then god created Means. you for a time yeah right you are born you get the best out of this life right and you die but then, so live your best life. You might as well just go all yeah, out. Yeah, there's a book about that. Please don't purchase it. Um, <laughs> li living your best life now. Um, but if the Bible speaks about this life being a blink of an eye, yeah, and God wants you to put emphasis on the life to come, right? As it says in Colossians three, right? We need to fix our eyes on things above, where Christ is. Then. Why are you spending most of your effort making something out of this life mm. instead of surrendering it all to God and say, God, this is yours. You've given it to me. I want to give it back to you. And just whatever you want from me, I'll do it. I'm, I'm your servant. I'm your slave. You are my master. Wherever you want to lead me, I will go. I want to be obedient to you because your love that you've demonstrated on the cross and the resurrection that you've overcome the death that is becoming my destiny that mm. that is my destiny it's no longer my destiny yeah death is no longer my destiny that's the beauty of jesus when he says i am the resurrection and the life yeah he says even though you'll die but you'll live again mm -hmm. so this, this is the beauty of why we celebrate easter sometimes i get that it can become commercialized yeah. right you go 
shops you see bunnies chocolate bunnies eggs blah 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 and that can be discouraging sometimes you feel like uh i i get to see certain people in easter church yeah, and i won't see them until christmas yeah but i just encourage you for your personal life for for yourself that you come to the lord and say god thank you uh, which i need to be reminded daily but thank you that we actually celebrate this mm -hmm. every single year yeah to say yeah. that jesus unlike the thousands of people that died on the cross he was the only one that was resurrected yeah yeah that's the distinct that's the that's how we can speak to a muslim a buddhist a hindu or whoever it is it's the person of Jesus and what he's accomplished. Amen. And if he wasn't raised, there'd be nothing special about what we teach, about what we preach or how yeah. we live. Um, so Buddha is dead in his grave. Muhammad is in his grave. Um, whoever other people follow, they're all in the grave. Mm -hmm. the Abraham, only, Moses, yeah. you know. The only empty grave that you're going to go and see is jesus empty grave until the second resurrection then we join him <laughs> that, that's it yeah we're waiting for that so yeah. any any last words before yeah, we I, close as you were saying you know it can be very commercialized with easter and secularized um we we've turned a lot of christian holidays into just you know secular holidays and people take a day off from work and that generally happens but one of the amazing things is like you know for example, the first church, they met and they congregated pretty much daily. But that first day of the week was a commemoration for them of the resurrection of Jesus, mm -hmm. that he's alive. So they would come, they would join, they would, you know, worship the Lord in a very sacred way because this is the day that he, ro he rose. Mm -hmm. And they're emphasizing this importance of the fact that Jesus is alive. Right, he's not in the tomb. He's not dead. He's not someone that we look back two thousand years ago to and say, "Well, he was a good teacher," like many other religions. We look at him alive today, now, speaking to us, guiding us, leading us. Right, he's building us up, building up his church, and then in the eschaton, in the eschatology, in the the future, he's coming back for us. Right, and he's going to make all things new. He's going to redeem us but not just us community, you individually. And that should impact every aspect of your life. It should impact the way that you live. It should impact the way you speak. It should imp impact every part of you. And I, like, I remember this was something that when I was younger, I had a choice. And <clears throat> I could have had a very lucrative career. I could have set something up really, really, ex like it could have been something pretty big. Mm-hmm. And I made a choice, no. I made a choice to follow God and to pretty much leave Australia, go out and serve him for, you know, over 10 years. Pretty much being poor and broke the whole time, right? God had provided and he took care. But then I look back at it and I'm like, I don't regret that. I don't regret it at all. I could have set something up here for the here and now. I could have had a house, could have had, you know, everything else that everyone else has. But there's something distinctive about living a resurrected life already here on earth, that you're looking to the future, you're looking to something that goes beyond the physical. And that's what we need to do. Remember when Leonard Ravenhill, he preached his, in his famous um, sermon, he said, God, please stamp eternity on my eyeballs. You know, help me to see things through your eyes. To help me to see things through the lens of the gospel, mm -hmm. through the lens of eternity. Because yeah. that's what the cross leads us to. The cross leads us to look at eternity and to look at what's going to happen after these 70 or 80 years on earth. And it's not that we have our heads in the clouds and when, you know, um, they say if you have your head in the cloud, you're no earthly good. It's the opposite. The more you focus on eternity, the more you focus on the kingdom of God, the more useful you will be for him in this world. Amen. Yeah? Amen. And so that's how I want to take it personally for me. I want to be so invested in the kingdom and so invested in the truths of the gospel that mm -hmm. God will actually use me to do something amazing in the world for his kingdom. And in that way, we're storing up treasures in, in heaven. Amen. You know? So whatever your excuses are, consider this verse, guys. 
Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the suffering of the present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And, and that's what we're going to have in Christ. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going to have for eternity. So I really hope that you're enjoying your Easter um, or Resurrection Day. That's another topic where mm -hmm. people like to um, choose words and whichever they feel like is more The point is Jesus more suitable. is alive. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's what it that's is. Point, Empty right? grave, Jesus is alive. That's the most important thing. But I just encourage you that... Um, Use this time to reflect how Easter, how Jesus' resurrection, it should be influencing your life. Mm. You might be, for example, you might feel like you're lukewarm. You're like, yeah, I believe in this stuff. I go to church on Sundays. I, I speak Christianese, right? Because I know, I know the Christian language. Uh, but then I feel like there is something in my heart that God wants me to go 110%. Yeah. And there's a lot of things in my life that I haven't surrendered yet. So I just encourage you to look what Jesus has given up. God, if you read Philippians 2, 5 to 11, he was equal to God. He gave that up. He took a form of a man, limited himself, became a servant, died on the cross so imagine what Jesus gave up for you. Yeah. So whatever we give up for Jesus is nothing, nothing compared. Nothing. It should make it easy. Yes. Yeah. So I just encourage you to think about it, to meditate on it in Easter. Amen. God bless you. We'll see God you next you time. Guys. Take care.